If you've watched videos on YouTube about jazz improvisation, including on this channel, you may have heard about modes, chord extensions, substitutions, two fives, guide tones, chromatic enclosures, tritone substitution, not to mention triad pairs, modal interchange, and pentatonic shape shifting. You might have been advised that chord tones should occur on the downbeats while rhythmic accents are placed on the offbeats. Swing feel could be described as a quarter note and an eighth note arranged within a triplet, but not exactly and not always. Now it's a foregone conclusion that all scales should be practiced in all keys and the circle of fifths should be second nature. You may have seen videos that promise to teach you a simple trick or lick or pattern or note that can take your improv to the next level. So the problem as I see it with a lot of jazz pedagogy, again, including my own, is that it gives a misleading impression of what's actually going on when jazz musicians improvise, and it makes it seem more complicated than it needs to be. As the thumbnail points out, I'm as guilty as anyone of contributing to information overload. I've been teaching jazz for more than four decades, I've written a book on it, and I've posted a series of videos on YouTube. My first videos were made when I was just getting my feet wet with YouTube and I didn't have a clear idea of where I was heading. During COVID, when I was faced with teaching my university courses online, I started churning out videos in sequence based on the curriculum for my improv class. That resulted in a series of videos in the Jazz Tactics playlist that are jam-packed with useful information, if I do say so myself. But they move pretty fast and a lot of it goes over the head of someone who's just trying to figure it out on their own. At this moment, I find myself at an inflection point in my own career, but also on this channel. I'm thinking about the way improvisation is taught, especially on YouTube, where you're talking to an audience who cannot respond except after the fact by leaving a comment. Now on that topic, the comments give me a sense of who's watching these videos, what's helpful and what's not. Hearing other perspectives benefits the whole community. Also an active discussion in the comments sends a positive signal to the algorithm, although that's more my concern than it is yours. But the bottom line is, I encourage you to leave a comment on this and every video that you watch. Now I'm sure that I don't need to tell you to like and subscribe, but that's what all the cool kids seem to do. In my very first jazz video, I put forward the premise that you already know how to improvise by comparing it to spoken language. When you speak, you do so with no conscious thought about the words or the rules of grammar that govern the use of those words. In fact, you learned how to speak before you were ever taught any of those rules. When your musical vocabulary expands to include advanced melodic, harmonic, and rhythmic devices, that broadens your palate and it allows you to express things in different ways. But in language, big words are not necessary to communicate effectively and sometimes they have the opposite effect. For example, to put that sentence another way, gargantuan verbiage is not indispensable in the dissemination of efficacious enlightenment. Concise writing is described as using the fewest possible words to convey an idea. Now that doesn't make it easier to write, but it makes it a lot easier to read. And every university professor has read student essays that contain far more words than necessary in order to reach the required word count. Now in my book, the same could be said for a jazz solo, and I often reference two quotes that speak to this one. From Miles Davis, who said, you've got to know a hundred notes you can play, then pick four. The other is from Hal Galper, who advised students to learn to hear everything and play everything you hear then hear everything and play as little of it as possible. In jazz, it's easy to point to exceptions to this rule, but even Coltrane, commenting on what was called his sheets of sound, said he hadn't yet figured out what he wanted to play, so he tried to play everything in search of it. As a jazz musician, you want to get to the core of the music. Learn how to bake a great cake before you worry about the icing or rely on the icing to cover up the fact that you haven't actually baked a great cake. For the jazz musician, that could mean delving into the melodic possibilities that exist in the lower structures of the chords before you worry about what you can layer on top. Imagine improvising a solo that is so clear and concise that it actually becomes a new melody, like Coleman Hawkins did with Body and Soul. If you want to check that out, watch this video. In jazz pedagogy, much of what we teach is analysis after the fact. If you transcribe a great solo and you identify a section where the soloist played a bebop scale, for instance, that's not what was in their mind at the time they played it. Now this is not an argument against practicing bebop scales, but a recognition that the point of practicing them is so that in the course of a solo they come out organically as opposed to being inserted artificially. Now if you've never heard of bebop scales, well I'm talking to you in this video, but also you can learn more about them from this one. In a lesson recently, a student asked a question that I think cuts to the quick. I was demonstrating how to use chromatic approach notes to embellish a melody, and he said, I get it, 
but how did you know in advance that if you start on this note and descend chromatically, that you'll wind up on the target note at exactly the right time? If we put this in the context of a bebop scale, well, we can explain how the addition of a chromatic passing tone makes most of the chord tones happen on the downbeats, and that makes the harmonic outline clearer. But if you start the bebop scale in the wrong place, well, it has exactly the opposite effect. So how do you know? Now, there are ways to codify this kind of information, Barry Harris's method, for example, but many students are still left wondering how to get from practicing something to using it in an improvised solo. The more information that we shove into our brain, the more likely we are to be thinking when we should be listening. Theoretical information is more directly applicable in a compositional sense, when you've got time to think and rethink what you've written. Improvisation is a form of composition, but when you have to output the music in real time, you don't have the time to think. If you try to remember which scale to play over a given chord, it's too late. So how do we get to the point, or guide someone else to the point where knowledge is a help, not a hindrance to spontaneous action, when theoretical information is understood not as a concept, but a sound? A foundational premise of the Suzuki violin method is that since children learn to speak before they learn to read, the same can be true of music when it's taught by ear. Now, I think all music would be best if it's learned by ear. Imagine if classical students had no access to printed music, and they had to learn all the concertos from a recording. For jazz improvisation, I think it's essential. Jazz musicians transcribe solos because we're learning the language the way we first learned to speak, by listening and imitating. Now, I've made several videos about solo transcription, and I'll link to them in the description. When you transcribe jazz solos, you learn the vocabulary, but also things that cannot adequately be notated or described, like tone quality, time feel, and phrasing. In other words, you learn to speak the language like a native. Now, there can be value in analyzing a solo after you've transcribed it to understand on a theoretical level why something sounds good, and the theory will make more sense once you've absorbed the sound. I think that the majority of the benefit is reaped from the repeated listening, as you try to figure out what the notes are, followed by imitation when you try to reproduce all the nuances of the original solo. In my university improv class, the students had to perform a solo that they had transcribed. Now, I actually had no way to know for sure whether they had transcribed it themselves, but if they hadn't, it was pretty obvious in the performance. When you listen to someone play along with the recording and it's so close that you can barely tell the difference, or you listen to them play it without the recording and it sounds like they're actually improvising, you know that the music has gone in on a deep level. Now, if I'm being honest, if you ask me to teach you to improvise, the best thing I could say to you is to come back after you've transcribed 50 solos. You'll learn more from doing that than taking lessons with me or watching my videos or buying my books, although I certainly encourage you to do all those things as well. This video is sponsored by ChaseSandborn.com. Now, this sparks the question of whether jazz improvisation is something that can be taught. I'd consider it more of a guided self-exploration. You might think that a course or lessons or videos can teach you, but without many hours on your own, you won't get it. You can't just know how to improvise. You've got to feel it. Now, this is no different than learning to play your instrument. How many hours of practice take place, or should take place, between lessons? You learn to play in the practice room, not the teaching studio, but a teacher can certainly help when it comes to getting the most from the hours that you spend practicing. In the words of Andrew Carnegie, you can't push a person up a ladder unless they're willing to climb themselves. Now, another wise man told us that a student learns not from seeing or hearing, but doing. This is a challenge for teachers on YouTube because it's essentially a passive medium. I talk or demonstrate, and you watch and listen. Now, a motivated student will take what they see and hear and apply it. But a good teacher knows just how much to give, so that a student feels intrigued and inspired rather than overwhelmed. Here we have the problem that a YouTube audience is not homogenous. You sort of have to pick a demographic that you're pitching to. As I said, most of my previous jazz videos were created with my university students in mind who are at a stage of life where learning how to play jazz is the dominant force in their daily existence. Most of my online students are adult amateurs who may have returned to music after years away. Aside from the differences in learning when you're older, they generally don't have access to the teachers' classes and ensembles that university students do, along with being surrounded by like-minded peers. And you can hear more of my thoughts about that in this video.
So in planning future content for this channel, I'll be thinking about the person who's out there trying to do a lot of this on their own with the help of YouTubers like myself. I'll be looking for ways to emphasize the sound of the music as opposed to the theory that explains the sound, and to provide concrete and manageable ideas for practice sessions. I'll delve into my own videos and see if I can identify things that would benefit from a more detailed explanation. And as always, I'll be guided by what I read in the comments, so talk to me and stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.